we welcome you. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm Dan DeBruler, and we are continuing our series, Grace Unveiled, getting kind of to the hard part now. Not the hard part for me, the hard part for us. You know, let me, let me just tell you, I listen to a lot of music. I mean, I always have listened to a lot of music. I can recall listening to classic rock back with it's just rock and the oldies when they were new. And I would sit and listen to records. Yeah, records. Over and over to the point where I knew complete albums of music. I can still hear some albums today and sing along word by word and even do some blistering air guitar solos off those same songs. And maybe, maybe that's you too. Maybe you have a lot of music in your life and that's part of your thing. But somewhere in the picture, Jesus entered in. And as he began to change me, as I began to see the world through different eyes and with a different heart, I realized I wasn't quite so proud of all the lyrics to all those songs that I knew anymore. I didn't want to sing those things anymore. I didn't even want to think those thoughts. And so it began to change. And I, I didn't know much about church music when I first came to Christ. I knew a lot of music, but the church music just wasn't really cutting it for me at, at the time. But I had this friend who introduced me to Christian rock. And suddenly I heard these people with the same passion, the same passion for learning something and for conveying a message, but they were conveying a different message. And at the time, contemporary Christian music was just coming of age. It was a little on the kumbaya side for me. But I could lean into these people, and suddenly I was learning new words to new songs, and they became part of who I was. And I'll say, you know, music is still a passion, but now what I love has gravitated toward what is impactful and what is true and what is derived from the Word of God. And don't get me wrong, I don't base my theology on music but if I were being honest with you, I'd say I probably know as many song lyrics as I do Bible verses. Because it, it touches me, it reaches me, it gives me something to sing, not beyond even the reason to sing. And so it wasn't really surprising when a friend of mine who has dealt with stage four brain cancer, yet was fighting through it, and he was a musician as well and a longtime friend, and as he walked through his battle with cancer, his faith was what was shining and what was showing through as he began to share with people the faith and the hope that he had in Christ as he was dealing with this cancer that looked like it was going to take him from his children and, and leave his wife a widow. But he beat it. Yet just a few days ago, he sent out a video on social media. He was sitting in the parking lot of a cancer center. And he said, man, I have gone through all this stuff. And you could see kind of the worry, the stress on his face. As he said, man, I've been through all of this and I have been faithful to God. I've encouraged so many. And now I just came out. They told me now I have prostate cancer. And I could see this worry, and you know how social media is. You know, you, the, all the comments were like the praying hands, and I'll pray for you, brother, or, you know, a, a verse, a verse of Scripture. But I thought, I don't want to be one of those people who sends the empty promise of, I'll pray for you, man. So instead, I went to a song. Because just a few days earlier, I had listened for the first time to an album that is easily... 15 years old, and the song that I went to, the whole album was written by a singer-songwriter who was well-known for encouraging others, and it was written in the year following when he and his wife lost their five-year-old daughter. Every song was this, what I thought was going to be a painful lament, it was actually songs of hope, reminding people of who God is and how true his promises are. And so with my friend, I shared these words as he walked through his hardship, the words from this one song. It said, this is not how it should be. This is not how it could be. But this is how it is. And our God is still in control. 
See, I want to leave with you today the fact that we should lean toward what is true. And sometimes the truth is hard. Sometimes the truth implicates us. But as we emphasize the truth of who God is and his unchanging, unwavering sovereignty, I want to lay that as the foundation as we step into talking about a rather difficult topic, talking about Judgment Day. You know, each one of us needs to think about this seriously, consider it deeply, and ask ourselves, where will we stand on Judgment Day? But we're talking about the promises of God today. We're talking about grace and the giver today. And about him, I want you to believe what is true. I only want to tell you what's true. So let's pose this question to ourselves today. And by the way, if uh, not all of the scripture it will be on the screen today, but if you've got the Rockfish Church app on your phone, your mobile device, your iPad, whatever you got with you, you just click take notes and it'll take you right to all the scripture, all the notes. You can follow along with these things. But to the question of where are you going to stand on Judgment Day? You know, I think we all have notions about who we are and how we live and maybe even some dangerous misconceptions about how we're justified when those two cross over. None of us really knows. No, none of us knows at all the number of days that we have. We don't know our own timeline beyond this moment right now. But God does. And God made a way and God has a plan but there will be a moment for all of us that we account for how we lived in light of that truth. Judgment day is a reality that we all will face. But what does it take to stand confidently in that day? Let's, let's take a, a look. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, beginning with 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. See, when we come to these words, these words of Jesus, we should pause because this is not so much about judgment or judgment day or our final accounting. This is about hypocrisy. This passage is about believing or professing one thing and living another Continuing in verse 22, he says, On that day many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. These should be frightening words, especially to this group of people. Those of us who are sitting in church, those of us who profess faith in Christ, or at least curious about what faith in Christ looks like. Having Jesus say, depart from me, I never knew you, should give us reason for concern. So let's talk about the danger and the deception of empty professions of faith. You know, that warning from Jesus in that passage is simply this. Professing faith isn't enough. Going to church is not enough. Bowing your head before you eat at Wendy's is not enough. Serving the homeless, inviting a co-worker to church, even checking off seven items on the My Reach page, which you can find in the Rockfish app, by the way. That's not enough. What matters is whether our hearts are truly aligned with Jesus with what he taught, with what he said, and how he taught us to live. We can look at the parable of the sower, and I know we've taught on this recently, but I want to read this to you. If you've got your Bible or the Bible app, you can read along in uh, Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to start at verse 3. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they didn't have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, but since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they scorched them. They were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. 
Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And he said, he who has ears, let him hear. And what he meant by that is, man, you need to get this. You need to understand everyone, every one of us in this room is described somewhere in that simple parable. We're all there. Perhaps we're that seed. We're the people, we're the ground, we're the path. And that seed fell. You know, we're some of those well-worn people in the world. And the seed, the seed of truth, the word of God, it, it hits and it just kind of bounces when you, when you consider it within the analogy, within the parable. It just kind of bounces and rolls off. Nothing happens. And that's like many of us. We hear the truth of the word of God. We hear the truth of the gospel. We, we hear that Jesus loves us and we can be forgiven and salvation is for us, but we, we don't really understand and we just kind of keep moving. We're these well-worn people. We, we know how to live. We know how to do. We know how to make a, a good living. And so the truth of the gospel just kind of bounces off of us and we just keep moving. See, Jesus went on to explain in the next few verses that the seed that falls on the path on the well-worn people of the world, it simply gets snatched away by the evil one, he says. Snatched like a, a bird, finding easy food just laying there. But maybe we're that rocky soil. Because in his parable, some of that seed fell on the rocky soil. And we've all seen the, the, those small, little, weak plants that come up along the side of the road. They never really grow or mature much at all. I mean, there's just enough soil. You know, imagine in your mind a rocky place, and there's just enough soil between the rocks for plants to get started. But they never reach the point of truly bearing fruit. Or in the case of a flower, they never grow strong enough to support the weight of a real blossom, of a real flower. They never reach maturity or reach their full beauty because there's nothing there. There's nothing there to hold it, to allow the roots to grow deep enough. And perhaps that's you today. Perhaps you have heard just enough, but you've never really grown. You've just kind of been hanging there in the starting gate for all of the time that you have known Jesus. But then he goes on to talk about the thorns. See, Jesus wasn't just talking about the people who don't believe, who hear the word and keep moving. He was addressing hypocrisy. The people who hear, the people who believe, and they begin to actually produce some fruit. And I know I have been that person in the past. I've heard, I've understood, I've believed, I've taken it to heart. But then things come along. And as you begin to grow in Christ, you don't get rid of the other things in your life as you allow him to grow and you yourself to grow in Christ. We just see the good news as just another thing. We see Jesus, we see Christianity as just something that we do. Church as somewhere we go. Nothing really changes, and it's just kind of choked out. Jesus describes those people as the thorny ground, the seed that sprouts up among the thorns. And we can find ourselves in that danger where we just add the truth of the gospel as another tool in the box but we keep everything that's contrary to that truth close at hand. Imagine, if you will, your own toolbox at home. For those of you who, who work with tools, you get that one really cool tool that will do amazing things. But if you just toss it in the toolbox and it's there, falls in with all those mismatched sockets and all the other things that you have in that toolbox and it just becomes buried under the old pliers and the vice grips that the thing doesn't work on. It's no good. 
and we begin to forget about it even being there. We forget that we have this one tool that will do that thing when we need that thing, and that's the gospel. The gospel is the one tool. The truth of the gospel, the truth of who we are in Christ is the one thing that makes the difference. That's the one we need to be able to find in the box. Let that be put in the drawer of your life with nothing else there other than more of the same. Other than knowledge of the gospel. But then maybe this is you. Man, I pray that it is the good soil. So the question we're asking today, beyond where will you stand on judgment day, is, is your faith fruitful? Are we producing fruit? Are we meeting the goal of our having heard and believed? Is our yield greater than the sum of the seed itself? I mean, what does that mean? What's the point of our hearing and believing? What is the yield, as Jesus told in the parable of 30, 60, 100-fold, even look like? See, we're not here to simply know and to understand, but to make disciples, to replicate and to reproduce followers of Christ. We read about that in the Great Commission. But it's not about how it looks. It's not about how other people see you or would describe you. It's about what's really true. That is what matters. Because we can put on a great show. I've done it. I pray you haven't. But we can put on a great show and, and fool people into believing that we are truly following Christ when really we are just enjoying the doing more than we're enjoying the God of what we're doing. There's a man like that in the Bible, in this parable of the rich young ruler. And if you've got your Bible and want to open it to Matthew chapter 19, beginning at verse 16, I'm going to read it to you. It says, And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so the young man said to him in Matthew 19, verse 20, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have the treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So here was a guy who, in context, was the epitome of the faithful churchgoer. He was there when the doors were open. He was out there doing all the right things. He was shaking hands and he was praying with brothers and sisters in Christ. But he had never truly sold out. In context, he was doing the right things and he was prospering as he built a successful life and business. Life was good for him. And he knew it. He had much. It calls him the rich young ruler in this encounter that he has with Christ because he had many things. He was a very successful guy, prospering as he built a successful business. And he was quite certain that all he was doing, all the status he had attained, had somehow assured him of a place in God's best favor. But when he comes and encounters Jesus face to face, and he has the opportunity to see what true sacrifice looks like, what an authentic relationship looks like, he discovers that's what it was that he lacked. And I think we could find ourselves in those same places as well, pretty easily. Life can be good. We can have many good things going on. We could be doing many good things for the Lord. But what did that passage say where we started? Many will say to me day, on that day, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that in your name? Didn't we do the other thing in your name? And what did he say to them? Depart from me. 
I never knew you. See, what the man lacked was an authentic, intimate relationship with the God that he sought to serve through all of the good that he was doing. In John 10, 10, 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. See, the, the rich young ruler, he was a good guy. Beyond being a successful businessman, he was a good guy. He followed the commandments, but he lacked a true surrender to Christ. And that's the question for us today. Am I fully, am I truly surrendered to Christ? Have I gone beyond the doing and into the knowing Christ personally? Do I have that kind of relationship with him? When Jesus is nudging me left or right like a shepherd would do, do I simply trust and accept his guidance? How many times in your life have you thought, I should do that thing? You don't know where the thought came from, but I should do that thing, and it's so contrary to who you are as an individual. Perhaps that's the Holy Spirit. Perhaps that is Jesus nudging you a little to the right because he is, as he says in this passage, the good shepherd. He knows us. And if we are his, we know him. And we will accept that gentle nudging as guidance. But do we? Do we follow his leading? Do we follow those taps, those nudges? Where are you going to stand on judgment day? It's a crucial question. And it's one that we're all going to be faced with. It's not just about saying the right things. It's not just about doing good deeds. It's about a genuine relationship with Jesus, about being willing like that rich young ruler who was not willing to forsake it all, to walk away from all that made him comfortable, to even walk away from all the good that he was doing to do great for Christ, to truly surrender, to truly follow him. So I'm going to ask you to ask yourself today, do I live what I profess to live? Am I living out the Great Commission? I mean, that's the measure for all of us. And what's the Great Commission? Are we going? Are we making disciples? Am I seeing people baptized as a result of the fruit in my life? Acknowledging the change that is happening in their life as a result of my discipling them. Jesus said, teach them to observe. If I were to paraphrase that, it'd be, am I teaching what Jesus taught? Am I living as an example? Again, the Great Commission is our measure of success. Is the seed taking hold in my life? Are people coming to know Jesus? Are they beginning to live like and walk with Jesus as a result of who I am in their world? Do I put my faith the the, the way we, in in Jesus, the way we might put on a Jesus t-shirt? Do I put my faith on and then go back to living the way I choose when I step back into my everyday routine? Or have I truly surrendered? Have I gone beyond the Jesus t-shirt? into a reflection of Christ in my life? Do I have a real relationship? Am I sold out? Am I fully trusting, following, and looking to Jesus to make my everyday life his life? You know, at the end of the exchange with the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, Jesus said this. He said, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But he continued, and it says, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. So in this world of temporary, I mean, temporary friendships, jobs, possessions, I'm sorry, even marriages, where we begin to see everything around us and understand that everything is temporary, We have to look at our relationship with Christ and ask, is it real? 
Is this something that I am really living? Am I sold out? Am I holding on to Jesus? Am I truly trusting and following? Am I obeying? You know, we're taught to teach others, to teach others to observe what Jesus commanded, to live as Jesus lived. Are we doing that? How can we be an example of Jesus in this world if we are not even embracing him ourselves? Can you say that you'll stand, stand confidently when it's all called into question? Man, this is a big deal for all of us. For us to ask these sel- ourselves these serious questions and just like as my taste in music changed and I gravitated toward things that are true, as I walked away from those things that had no business being in my mind, let alone coming out of my mouth, have you gravitated toward truth in your life? Do you prefer what is true even when the truth is hard? Because this is what we're called to do, just like the man described as a rich young ruler. Jesus said, leave all that makes you comfortable. Leave all that you think you're doing that is good. Put it all behind you. Give it away if it's in the way. And come follow me. And that's what he's calling you to do as well. Take those things that are holding you back. Take those untruths that are filling your head, the records that you have memorized, all the things that you know, maybe the things that you're really good at that don't serve the purpose of bringing others to Christ that are not part of you fulfilling the great commission and just put them aside. Lean into Christ. Allow him to take that shepherd's crook and nudge you toward what he knows is a better place for you. Will you stand with me today? Father God, I pray that as as we end our few minutes here today, the people in this room with, and those who are watching online or even in the rockfish gatherings, that we would ask ourselves the hard question, am I following you? That we would look ourselves in the mirror and know that we're following you. Father, I pray that all that Jesus has for us, all that you have for us will become evident. I pray that we would lean into you more fully and more truly. And that you would not just become a greater part of our life, Father, but that we begin to ooze who you are into the world around us, Father. That we would fulfill the great commission just by waking and breathing each day, Father. That we would be a great example to others. That we would see people come to Christ and and confess that you are the Lord of their life through baptism as a result of the fruit in our lives. I pray that we would go further, that we would be teaching others to observe what Jesus commanded us, what Jesus taught us, because we're living that, because we are one with him. And I pray that we would just ask ourselves the hard questions. Where will I stand on judgment day? That we might not hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. Be with us as we go, Father. Convict us. Show us what you have for us. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. If you would like a prayer or you want to pray with someone, we'll have some people down front. Thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful day.